astrophysicist and ageing researcher Josh Mitteldorf studies ageing from an evolutionary perspective. He has written two books, Cracking the Aging Code, published in 2016, and Aging is a Group Selected Adaption, Theory, Evidence and Medical Implications, published in 2017. These books lay out the evidence that aging is an evolutionary program. Middeldorf, uh, welcome to Modern Healthspan and thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Well, thanks for finding me. Thanks for reaching out to me. I've thank got you. a minority opinion and always glad to have it aired. <laughs> Excellent. Um, that's what we like. So can you tell me something about your history and how you got into biology and, and why is this, why it is that it's biology that you've chosen to study? Yeah, I, I was an astrophysicist dotting the I's and crossing the T's in uh, distant parts of the universe, active galactic nuclei and doing computer models of how they work and realizing that I wasn't making, I mean, it's really interesting stuff, but the kind of questions I was asking were interesting only to a handful of people in the world. And in 1996, I read an article in Scientific American, uh, Richard Weindruck, talking about caloric restriction. Mm. And up until that time, I'd been a health nut. I thought the way to be healthy and live a long time is get all the nutrients that your body needs. And, you know, they're always discovering new ones and avoid toxins. Toxins are what build up and kill you eventually, or give you cancer. I mean, that was really the way that I thought. And along comes this paper in Scientific American that says not only do mice live a lot longer when you feed them less, they're deprived of nutrients, but this works across every, almost every species where it's been tried. The less you feed them, the longer they live. So I, I, I done a little bit of evolution. I actually taught a course in evolution uh, when I was a Harvard grad student years before that. And I scratched my head. And I, well, what's the meaning of this? Well, if it applies to all these different species, it must have an evolutionary source. And if they're doing better without food than with food, there's nothing the body can do without food that it couldn't do with food, right? If you wanted, if the body wanted to just dump that food out the back end, the body could dump that food out the back end. So if the body is doing better in a situation of hardship, this is now, I, I didn't know the word then, but it's now called hormesis and it's very general, but caloric restriction is the best known uh, example. Mm. If the body does better under hardship, than it does without hardship. That means that the body has chosen to set aside some of its fitness and save it for a rainy day. And that was the inspiration that said, um, here's a field in which I can make a basic contribution. I can ask a question, I can answer a question that a three-year-old can answer. <laughs> I can answer a question that a three-year-old can ask. In fact, my, my, my small children were already asking, why, why do animals get old and die? Uh, and isn't that a higher mission than dotting the I's and crossing the T's at the distant regions of the universe? That's how I got into the field. Right. And that was back in 1996. And... Um, so can you fill in a little bit of the detail between <laughs> that and <laughs> Well, a little bit. The beginning was that I put my, um, put my theory out to thousands, I think several thousand um, evolutionary biologists who had a list serve. Now, this was before there was a World Wide Web. Well, there was a World Wide Web, but there was, there was email but there was no spam in those days. There was no advertising and commerce mm. on the web. It was really just growing out of its academic phase. So I, I sent this letter out to a thousand ep 
evolutionary biologists, I actually got dozens of answers. And they all said the same thing. You're, you're full of malarkey. This, doesn't, this isn't the way the world works. Go read George Williams' book about how evolution works and then talk to me. And um, I tried to, I did. I tried to, I figured out why they believe what they believe. I figured out why it's probably wrong and uh, I got in touch with other people who had made a career out of group selection. Now, this is the, the selfish gene model had been dominant most of the 20th century. The selfish gene is about individual selection. Anything that's good for the individual is what gets selected. Anything that's good for the group but bad for the individual, it's not going to survive because there's no such thing as group selection. And this was the dogma that I inherited. And yet there were a handful of really interesting and smart evolutionary biologists who even at that time had had a 20 year history of saying, you know, you've taken a wrong turn. Group selection and individual selection are both parts of evolution. And you need a science to determine which prevails. So I got in touch with David Sloan Wilson, who was the, the leader of this cabal uh, trying to initiate a rebellion against the selfish gene. He became my mentor, told me what to read, how to think, um, tremendously valuable to me toward the last few years of the, the last millennium. Uh, and at that point, I thought, all right, I, I'm all set. I understand this. And I sent in a an article to the Journal of Theoretical Biology and sat bated breath waiting for the answer. And it was months later, I got back an answer that said, JTB wouldn't touch this with a 10 foot pole. <laughs> and that was their review. That was my peer review. Right. Wow. So I, I went from that over a period of 20 years to having two books published, to being taken seriously, for being ridiculed, to being denounced, to being argued with. I'm, I'm engaging people. There's actually a, a dialogue about why what I'm saying is wrong. And it's been, on the one hand, tremendously satisfying to see a fundamental change in the way many evolutionary biologists think about the subject. And they're, they're, they're taking up the tail end. The molecular biologists have left them behind long ago. They all, all realize that you don't fix aging by repairing damage. You fix aging by, res by reverting the metabolism to a younger state of signaling. It's all about signaling. And they've been doing this for years. They, they understand this. And if you ask them uh, whether aging is programmed, they'll whisper to you, yeah, but I, I don't want to say that in public. It, it just, it's bad for my funding. But all these guys at, at this point, they know what's going on. And it's tremendously satisfying to me to see that. And uh, you know, I could whisper names to you of people who have told me in private that, yes, they believe in programmed aging, but don't tell anybody about it. Um, and on the other hand, it's tremendously frustrating. It's 24 years now. It's 24 years now. How long does it take for the scientific community to recognize that their theory and the experiments don't line up? So there's your short answer. It wasn't so short. Right. No, that was good. Thank you. I hope that you found the video informative. Please do hit the thumbs up button, subscribe to our channel and hit the bell button and choose all for any new video release notifications. It encourages us to continue to create more videos about anti-aging and extending healthy lifespan. Thank you so much for your kind support. I wish you all well and we'll speak to you again soon.